Boys and girls, what's up? It's your boy BQ with the Impact Lounge. You already know, it, but I'm going to say it anyway. It's the number one place to be for the Impact Wrestling fan. I've got to throw this apology out there to you guys. My last couple uploads, uh, whether it's YouTube here or the Patreon, I don't know what was going on with my settings, but instead of recording my microphone, it was recording the the webcam. And um, I really apologize. I really didn't notice because I didn't listen back to them. I didn't know... Um, they sounded that bad. Uh, it was my rebellion review. Um, some of the stuff I did for the Patreon. So I really, really apologize um, that it sounded that way. I do not like to put audio out like that. Um, so, so many apologies to you guys. Thank you for um, for those who kept riding with me anyway, kept rocking with me. There was there was many of you who just continue to listen to content regardless. Um, but I just I don't like to put out stuff like that. So I'm I'm really really sorry. Hope you can forgive. Uh, speaking of the Patreon, I have a, um, a free, a free post on there right now that costs you nothing. Um, but if you go to patreon.com backslash BQ speaks, I'm talking about my concerns with the Steve Macklin title reign, what I'm worried it's going to be, what I'm worried is going to happen. Um, I compare it to another former impact world champion and, um, you know, I'm a little concerned. So, uh, you know, definitely check that out on Patreon. It is, it is a uh, free right now. Um, all right, so we're going to talk impact, obviously, here in the place to be. Um, it kicked off with with BTI, and I, I actually watched uh, the match of Shogun and Jack Price versus Heath and Rhino because I wanted to see, you know, what can these guys do? And I'll watch BTI if I, if, if I'm not gonna watch the whole thing, hell no, but but if the match, the feature match is something I have some interest in, you know, why not? Why not take eight minutes out of my day to, to watch it? So um, I was hoping to see, a, you know, we got two gut check winners here. Uh, Jackson Stone won it in 1979, and Jack Price won it um, a few years ago during the Obama administration. So um, I was hoping, you know, we're finally kind of starting to see these guys on TV a little bit, and I'm and I'm hoping to see why did these guys win. What stood out about these guys? Um, you know, we're seeing Jason Hotch on TV a little bit, obviously. But these guys, we haven't. Especially Shogun. And I say especially because he won it so long ago. You know, um, so let's see what these guys got. They didn't get as much offense in as I was hoping for. I was hoping. So, I mean, first of all, I'm confused because Jack Price is kind of wrestling as a heel. With Shogun, I can't really tell, but I don't think he's supposed to be a heel. I don't think he's been a heel a couple times we have seen him. So it, it was a little bit of a weird dynamic for me, but I didn't get to really see, you know, what can these guys do? The first time Jack Price was in the ring, he was, you know, Heath was on the offense almost the entire match. And then Shogun got in, got a little bit of offense in. But, you know, I wanted to see the suplexes and all that shit. And I just, I just, we just didn't see it. And as I, as I say, it's the same old song and dance with Rhino. It's the EC dub. It's the gore. Um, so the match was not what I was hoping for, but I think Jack Price has a one-on-one -on -one match with, with, uh, Brian Myers from three weeks ago that I, I'm going to go ahead and check out. Maybe, maybe I got a little bit more from that. I'm guessing he's wrestling as a baby face for that one. So, you know, we'll see, but you know, I'd like to see these guys on screen and throw shit at the wall. See if it sticks. I mean, it just seems like they're scared to put them on there. You know, I don't, I don't know what the reasons are. They can say it's creative. I don't know. It's not that serious when you're a small company. Like this isn't um this isn't Monday Night Raw and you're afraid to throw someone out there because millions of people are watching. Like give it a shot, you know? Why not? Uh Jack Price has a very killer theme song by the way. You know, I'm not a big fan of Impact theme songs, but his his, his is pretty killer. Uh so let's get into this this actual episode. Um you know, I thought this was a good episode. I when when I saw the card come out, I said, "Why are all the job guys on this card?" You know, and and I think when you do an episode after a pay per view, I think there's some. I would say there's some struggles in how to structure a card like that because some of the feuds are over, so you have to start building new ones, right? And there's some storylines that can continue from the pay per view. So I, I guess it makes sense. Hey, have these guys who no, nobody beats show up on the show, get some momentum. I mean, like, really think about it. Jack Grice, um, 
Shogun, The Good Hands, Jabba Mora, uh, Alicia Edwards. Um, I feel like there was someone else on here too. It's it's just like that group of people who don't beat anybody and they're like dominating the show. So, you know, at first I'm looking at the card. I'm like, whoa, you know, like this is this is going to be a rough episode. Um, You know, and even when they kicked it off with the six way, I was like, yo, that's the best match on the show. You're kicking it off with it. What the hell? What's going to close the show? You know, so I, I was I th- I was worried. I was. But I thought overall it was pretty good. I didn't think there was anything great on the show. But there was nothing bad on it. There was nothing I was looking at it. I'm like, oh my god, get this off my screen. I didn't. I didn't feel that this episode. I mean, yes, when I see Scott Demore, I want him off the screen. But I just mean there was nothing that I would classify as bad. Now we know viewership was up like 133 thousand, something like that, the, the, the highest since March of 2022. So that's great. That's interesting. I wonder why though, because I don't think there was a, that like buzz coming out of Rebellion. Really, you know, I would when I was. You know, previewing the show and everything, I said, there has to be a surprise on this show. There has to be. And it was Nick Aldis. Is he a needle mover? Not really. I mean, there's not many needle movers out there, but I don't think, I just don't think it was that. I don't think it was Steve Macklin being champion. Um, All I can think of is, hey, maybe out of curiosity, it's like a fresh, it's a fresh era. There's like, it's not dominated by Josh Alexander and his, his, the C4 spike and the packages, the slow-mo packages, they do him every week. And his promos, like it, it wasn't dom- like we knew that this was going to be fresh. So maybe, maybe that's what it is because it wasn't the card. Like if, if you look at the card, like it, it's not that it can't be. So hopefully it wasn't like an anomaly. Hopefully um, it's the sign of some momentum going forward. You know, um, that pay-per-view momentum, like hope, hopefully it just, hopefully next week we, we get it. It probably won't be that high, but hopefully it's in the ballpark, you know? So, um, the viewership has been a little bit decent lately, but the shows haven't been. So, you know, this one being okay, hopefully it's, it's more of this going forward. It there's, it's not a secret that there was no corny, um, coven and death doll stuff on here. The coven were on here, but I, I will get to that, but I actually like what the coven did. There was none of that. There was no Bully Ray and Tommy Dreamer. Um, there wasn't a bunch of Santino. Like he was on there a little bit, but you know, uh, you know, Dango. I don't think it's a it's it's a coincidence that these guys aren't on this show and it's one of the better shows. You know, so um that's what I got to say about that. Let's let's jump into it. Let's jump into uh the results. But yeah, in BTI, obviously Heath and Rhino won. Um, uh, you know, cheap pop for the gore. They did this at the Rebel Complex, which is just a gorgeous, gorgeous, you know, facility. My God, if they could do wrestling here or television here, I should say, you know, more often than not, I think it would be really helpful. I think just for those who were maybe tuning in for the first time in a while and seeing this, you know, the presentation of it, I think, you know, I think it may help going forward. The the lighting was okay. It wasn't that dreary, the, you know, the filter, there wasn't the the over, you know, compensated dark colors and blacks and all that shit. Like it 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 just looked, you know, it looked better than it than it has. I thought the crowd sounded really dead for the majority of this. And maybe it's because we came off rebellion where they were hot. Um, because my guy Pat was telling me he was at the tapings that, you know, it was a good third of the people there. I think that's what he told me, a third that were at the pay-per-view. So we know it's not going to be 2000 people at a, at a taping, you know? Um, but it did not sound as loud as the previous episodes did. Uh, they, the, you know, I was hoping for a little bit of rowdiness, especially in this opening match. And I didn't really hear it. The opening was time machine versus Trey Miguel, Jonathan Gresham and Mike Bailey. And this was very popular amongst the impact fan base. I am not going to say it was a bad match. It was not a bad match. These are just not for me. The six-man choreographed dance routine matches. That It's just not what I enjoy when I'm watching wrestling. It doesn't mean I don't recognize that, hey, this was good. These guys are talented. They did some awesome moves. Like I recognize all that. So I'm not going to get in here, oh, what a shit match. Because it wasn't a shit match. It's just not for me. Um uh, where everything's just like really over rehearsed and the the dives and the flips and the, you know, everyone's standing together and someone jumping off the top rope, knocking over, 
like you know like bowling pins like that is not wrestling that i enjoy personally and as far as the people in the match i'm only really a fan of trey mcgill and jonathan gresham in the match i'm not a i'm not really a big motor city machine guns Kushida or mike bailey fan doesn't mean i dislike them i just i can't be a fan of everyone on the roster right like i'm not it's just trey and jonathan gresham that's what i care about i i want to see them do something one-on-one and there was just no explanation as to why this match even happened. It was just one of those wrestling for the sake of wrestling matches. Like these guys just, Trey, Gresham, and Bailey just had a, uh, a, a three way. And then all of a sudden they're just partners. Like, boom. Like it's, there's just like really no explanation. And it's weird because Trey's a heel. Gresham and Bailey are baby faces. I thought that. It, the match was a little disjointed at the time because Trey would have to tag in wrestle like a heel. And then when Gresham or Bailey came in, it had to, they had to wrestle baby face on baby face. So for me, like it was a little like disjointed in that sense. My, my, my only like real complaint about it though. And, and again, I know many of you like this. That's great. That's awesome. It's just not for me. Um, but my one complaint about this was it was entirely too long. I looked at my at the time at one point on my phone, and it was 23 minutes into the match, and it would not end. It it just continued, and I didn't think there was like, you know, there was a lot of cool moves, but it didn't get it to that second gear where there was like these awesome near falls and the crowd was into it. Like it just seemed like the match just would continue and just keep on going. Like um, and I, the reason I think the crowd was, was like a little dead during it was because I don't think they cared who won. Like I'm asking you right now, time machine and Kushida versus Trey Miguel, Jonathan Gresham and Mike Bailey. Did you care? I'm not saying, did you like it? Did you, do you like the wrestlers? That's not what I'm saying. Did you care who won this match? You, you cannot tell me the majority of you, some of you maybe, Yeah. The majority of you cannot tell me that you cared who won or lost this match. And I think that was the vibe in the crowd. That's why the, you know, when there was near falls, no one, oh, because it, because who cares? Like, we're seeing a good wrestling match. Awesome. But what about the winner? We don't care who wins. We don't care who loses. Nothing. There's no heat here whatsoever. It's just a wrestling match. So, but I thought it went entirely too long. I, th- I think it was ultimately like a 24-minute match. Why, why, why are we wrestling that long on TV? You know, but again, for those of you who liked it, yes, absolutely. Awesome. I am, I am happy for you. It is just not for me. Um, Jim Miller was backstage with Santino. Uh, the, <laughs> she asked if he was, you know, going to show up in the ring again. He's like, Oh, I don't know. So he, yeah, we're going to get him again at, at some point. I'm sure he's going to wrestle swinger at one point um, at rebellion. Even though I didn't really like that match, I was I was happy that Santino kind of wrestled rather than he wasn't really a comedy character in the match. Like he just kind of like did his thing. He's got his spots, you know. Obviously the Cobra and shit like that. He's got those. He's got those, but it wasn't like a like a comedy match. He wasn't doing the shit like he, that he was doing um, in WWE. Uh, Alicia Edwards walked up during this, and I know a lot of you don't care about Alicia, and you know that I do. But when she came up, um, and these backstage segments looked excellent this episode, by the way. They were really crisp and clear and good lighting. They All of them looked really, really good. So did Alicia. But um, she she comes up, and what are you going to do? You know, this psycho, lunatic, whatever, PC open, my husband in a casket. Boom, boom, boom. And, you know, kind of what I took out of it is that I thought that Alicia, like, they let her loose. Her acting as a babyface was always really bad. It was a community theater. And I, this is the second time we've heard her talk as a heel. And it was, to me at least, and I'm an Alicia apologist, I get it. But I thought she came off really, really natural, really, really good. And I think I think we're finding something um, interesting within her. And I think the pairing of her and Eddie can be can be very, very good. Um, he, she might be what he needs to get to that next level. And, and as I said, the last time Eddie talked on screen, he sounded pretty good too. Like they've, they've 
it seems like they've been working on the the heel cadence um when they're talking because i've always kind of talked about eddie's cadence and um you know this past uh, past couple episodes of impact like i mean of impact of aew i don't like darby allen i'm not a darby allen fan i do not like him his promos are awful but he is he is the last couple episodes done these in-ring promos that sound excellent and he's another like mush mouth just <laughs> and they were really really good and and what i thought in my mind like eddie edwards like yeah that's you know you you can get there eddie you know it's just a matter of finding the right delivery the right cadence not trying to speak too fast and um i i'm optimistic that that the heel eddie edwards you know dynamic the character i should say um is going to get a lot better here because i haven't been the biggest fan of it in the world and santino let her know that she's got a match so why why aren't you in your wrestling gear um and he he put her in a match and then she then she had the match i think they went to a commercial break and then uh she she had the match uh, they did a by the way before the match a real nice little package of diana perrazzo um but then we get Alicia Edwards versus Terror Rising. And, uh, you know, I can't help but this, like, my analytical mindset. He just let Alicia know that she was wrestling. And then, like, five minutes later, she there's an opponent in the ring waiting for her. So you're going to tell me that Terror Rising was aware that she was wrestling that night, but Alicia wasn't? Um, and where did they pull Terror Rising from? They weren't like, hey, random indie person, we need you for an opponent. Like, does that make any sense? But anyway, the match happens. Alicia Edwards versus Terror Rising. And I, and I talked about this before with, with uh, Hannafin on commentary, calling people by their last name all the time. And what I said last time was like, unless you're like Cena or in Austin, like those are, you know, those last names as part of their brand. And he likes to do, um, you know, Grace, James, you know, it, I I don't like it. Um, and he does it with terrorizing. And he's rising. That's like, a, you know, if someone's name was, it, it's obviously a play on terrorizing. I, I said this last time she was on the, on the screen. Um, it, It's like if someone came out and their name was Masturbation. He's just like, Bation. You know, like, it just sounds so fucking stupid. Like, it's a play on words. It's not the person's last name. You know? I... Whatever. Like, there... It's it's annoying to me. I'm sure that no one's even, like... It's probably never crossed the mind of 99% of you. But, um, I don't know. To me, it's a... Like, if, if the wrestler's horrifying. You know? Uh, flying! It, it just... <laughs> <laughs> no, so stupid. But anyway, Alicia wrestles uh, Terror Rising. And I said when Terror Rising wrestled Jody Threads, like I was I was more interested in her. Uh, you know, I thought she she sells pretty good. And I thought uh, Alicia wrestling in this heel role looked really good, actually. You know, I thought it was um, it was like a I never in my life thought I was going to see an Alicia Edwards squash match with her being the winner. I, I never in my life did I ever think that day would come. But Alicia wins. She gets a, a, a win. Like, holy, holy fucking crap. It's probably not going to last long, but uh, but she gets to win it. But I thought she looked good in the uh, the heel roll. She finished the match off. So, finishers, folks. I'm always talking about the damn finishers. Her finisher for the longest time was the the flatliner. And she used the, the, she used the flatliner every single match. She never won with it. They always kicked out of it. And then she had a... Um, a BTI match one time squash match. Well, I guess that was a, the second time we've seen her beat someone in a squash fashion. And she won with a, a neck breaker. And that was her new finisher. It was very similar to like the uh, um, rude awakening that Rick Rude used to do. That kind of neck breaker. <clears throat> she had a name for it and everything. And they said, oh, it's her new finish. And then, so that's what I'm thinking she's going to use here. And she uses the sit-out face buster, which is the worst move in wrestling. It is the worst finisher. There's some finishers that I don't like. I, you know, you guys know I don't really like the cutter. I don't like the spear. I don't like when people win matches with clotheslines. 
this is the worst finisher in wrestling. That that is that like like you know, Brie Bella used to do it, and you know that's like I don't have a finisher, so I'm gonna win with this. And there was in the Attitude Era, there were several women who used to use that move. Um, I think Tori Wilson used it at one point. X Pac could do it, Sean Waltman, but it is the worst finisher in wrestling. Like, please don't use that anywhere anymore. I really, I really, really hope that you don't. So after the match, and again, I never, never in a million years would have said Alicia Edwards was going to win a squash match and she was going to attack the wrestler after the bell. Like, never, 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 never. Anyway, she does that, and Jody Threat runs out. Um, and they're clearly setting up jo- Jody Threat versus Alicia. Is, is, is Alicia going to have a storyline for the first time ever? Because they're not on next week's card. So... Is, is there like a story here? Like, is Alicia gonna, as a wrestler going to get a storyline where she's not just being Eddie Edwards' wife, damsel in distress? Like, what is going on here? What in, what in the freaking world after like four years of her being in the company? Four or five years. Craziness. But um, she comes out. And then, you know, they go to a commercial. And then this was probably the worst part of the show was terrorizing and um, and uh, Jody Threat backstage. I mean, community fucking theater. The acting on that was horrible. Oh, my God. Thank God it only lasted about 20 seconds. Um, but at least Terror Rising was selling because they've done, they started doing these things where the, the loser of the match is backstage and they're, they're selling jack shit. So, um, but this was like horrendous, horrendous. Thank God it didn't last. Then we got Moose. With Brian Myers versus Jabba Mora and Boopy. Uh, well, Boopy was in the, the corner of Job, and um, and that he's going to be Jabba Mora until he wins. When I saw this match on paper, I was like, "Oh hell no!" But this was probably the best match of the show. I never, th- I don't think that any point they've actually let Jabba Mora like really wrestle. I think you know he did some of the stuff in like that X Division Championship on BTI or. Or something like that. I didn't. I didn't see it. But every time he's been in the ring, I'm just like, I don't see anything here. I saw some people on 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 Twitter saying that they should give him a run with the X Division Championship. Are you kidding? Like, but they gave this some time. At first, I'm like, it, it, at first when it's going, it's like, why is this match lasting so long? Like, Moose should be killing this guy. But then I realized, okay, they're giving a little time here. They're probably setting up Moose and Brian Myers versus. Boopy and Jabba more at, at uh, under siege or something like that, which is which is fine. But um, oh yeah, Boopy was another guy when I, when I said just like the jobbers on this um, episode, you know, like it just all the underneath talent was was on this card in one way, shape, or form. So uh, I know he wasn't on the match graphic, but it, it's just in one way, shape, or form. It was just uh, like like the enhancement guy, enhancement talent of rest of Impact Wrestling, just on one episode together which again like i said maybe that maybe that is the formula after a pay-per-view because you need guys to get wins and you, and you need the ones who can take losses and then you kind of like build the storylines from there so i'm not like being over critical about it i've you know maybe that's the formula um i mean the episode was okay so 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 maybe you know um but but i i saw a lot of people really enjoy the match and i don't know if um the cross body block the, the flying body press, whatever the hell they, they call it. Um, I know when I was growing up, there's like three or four different terms for it. Um, I don't know if that job more is finisher, but, but it looks really, really good. Um, they were kind of selling it like it was this finisher. So, so I don't know, but um, this was, this was really good. Moose gets the win. Uh, there's shenanigans. So, I'm, I'm, you know, we're fairly certain this is leading towards a tag team match and it's not next week. I don't believe I think they put out next week's card. I don't think it's on there. So um, maybe it's going to be an under siege thing. So that's good because I'm always saying that impact creates these little angles and then it's just on the next week. Like Boopy and Jabba Moore benefit nothing from having a little run in with Moose and Brian Myers and then wrestling on the next episode. None, nothing. So now, now that we've established there's a little something here between them, hopefully these guys wrestle on the next fucking show and win. Hopefully we get, you know, the Jabba Mora win and I can stop calling him that. Maybe he wrestles someone and wins. Maybe Boopy wrestles someone and wins. If you don't know why I say Boopy, it's because that's what um, uh, Bully Ray calls him or called him in that one episode. 
uh, where they were, had an interaction backstage, and I thought that shit was effing hilarious. You probably don't think it's hilarious that I keep saying it all the time, but to me, it's fucking funny. So, uh, but yeah, Moose wins. Moose wins uh, with the spear, and um, yeah, so pretty good match. Nick Aldis randomly, this motherfucker, like it. it I'm Jimmy Jacobs. Like, where did this dude come from? I know he's been working uh, backstage with Impact for a while, but I mean, he just randomly shows up with a microphone. Hey, I'm Jimmy Jacobs and sitting at like, you know, they could have cut to it and be like, hey, uh, new member of the backstage broadcasting team or something like that, whatever. Um, you know what was brutal before they went to this? Like, they did a uh, replay from the match. Um, of Moose and, and Jabamora and they cut to the replay and it's that fucking sound that they have throughout the episode. Whoosh. The whoosh with the little video game sound. They do it and then they cut out of the um the 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 replay and do the sound again. And then they cut to Jimmy Jacobs backstage with Nick Aldis and they do it again. So in the, in like 15 seconds it's just a whoosh it's like oh my god dude when like when they're putting this show together did they not like hey we're we're using this entirely too much like it does that not just cross their minds i don't like the sound is brutal to freaking begin with but to just like keep doing it is crazy but yeah so J jimmy jacobs randomly freaking talking with nick aldis well what i took from this was that it wasn't gia miller with the impact screensaver it was like the Nick Aldis logo and his colors and, and everything behind him. This is how they should do these backstage interviews. Like this looked really good. I don't know if it's just, I don't know if he wasn't even there. We're, we're going to see, but what happens on the next couple of episodes, he may not have been at these tapings. Maybe he did that like backstage. So, so it's, um, you know, the day of rebellion. So uh, it was a different area. I don't know, but I thought it looked excellent. And I think that they should always do backstage interviews like that. That's how they did it. Like back in the freaking eighties, you know, like Jake, the snake Roberts is talking. He's got his logo in the background, and everything like that. I think that looks cool and it looks different. I think the, the screen with the screensaver and it looks like shit. So this is how they should do it. And I think we all expected when we're going to hear from Nick, all this, like, we expected him to be in the ring. We expected him to come and ruin Macklin's thing. That's not what they did. He was, you know, just had a backstage interview segment. So it, it's kind of silly to promote that, but uh, being for what it was. But what I took from it is that Nick Aldis just, he's believable. He's such a great talker. Um, and he, he does the little things that, that brings respect and prestige to a title because he said, you know, the Macklin, like you have the champion's prerogative. It's a champion's prerogative for, for me not to be out there. So I respect that. I was a champion. I get that. That's Those are the little things that, you know, the little, just the little tiny things that, that make the title important, you know, that he's shown respect for the belt. So he's just a really good addition to the company. I thought when they used him at Slammiversary last year, I was upset about that. And... You know, of course, people are like, oh, you'll complain about anything. It was just, I wasn't so much upset about him being in the match. It was just that they were teasing, you know, a mystery fifth member. And instead of making a big deal about it, they just randomly show his face um, over We Own the Night or some shit like that. Oh, Nick Ali, you know, it was just, it was just the way that they did it that I was just like, what a fucking fart in church. Like they, they always do that when there's like a like a mystery fit, like when Bupinder Boopy was was it for the hardcore war. I mean, you everyone's thinking, oh, it's all this. It's they're gonna bring this is gonna sign this guy from AEW and da, da, da. you know, you see all that shit on Twitter, and then it's just it's just boopy, you know, like that is not 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 their good strong point. It's not a strong point for them is is mystery partners. Um if Dreamer wasn't already in the match, you know, I'm sure he would have been a mystery guy. So um, and then Skyler, uh, the good hands, this is a, 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 um, handicap match. So, uh, the good hands versus Frankie Kazarian. So I didn't talk about this on the review. I meant, I meant to say something about it. Th this was set up because the good, the good hands came in during the match and they said, Oh, it's no disqualification. Look, I understand matches are no disqualification, 
but there still has to be rules. There has to be like some kind of parameter because what's stopping the entire locking room locker room coming out and ruining the match? You can't just say, oh, well, it's it's no disqualification, so you can do whatever. Like, what's stopping someone from bringing a gun to the ring? Um, not killing someone, but just sh- I'm just going to shoot this guy in the, in the shoulder, um, and then I'm going to pin him. So you still, even though that's why, like you know, people like Jim Cornette's like lazy booking with with these hardcore matches and shit, because you get away from like logical storytelling. Um, so these guys run out, and then Frankie Kazarian puts Jason Hotch. I think it was through a table. If the objective is to win the match, that's the objective to win the match. Why is Frankie Kazarian? sacrificing himself and his body through a table with someone who's not a part of the match. So impact from a logical standpoint with wrestling is usually really, really good. They don't do a lot in the ring. That's illogical. Uh, Maybe creatively. Yes, but in the ring, they don't typically. So this stood out to me for that reason, because that's not usually, you know, whoever's the producers in impact, they do a really good job putting the matches together. They really do. I really think it is the best wrestling in wrestling. I I fully believe that. I know I watch other companies, but the in-ring product to me, Impact is number one. But stuff like this is a little, like, it doesn't make a lot of sense. But it leads to them having a match with each other, Kazarian versus the Good Hands. Uh, and, And again, as I said, it's just all the impact job guys on the episode. You know who's winning all these matches. Um, so we, we knew that Frankie Kazarian was going to beat these guys. Um, tapped him out with the the chicken wing. It's a pretty good uh, submission finisher that he he uses. I I like that um, quite a bit. But the good the good hands like we've never seen them win. And yeah, you want to have like jobbers in a company, like you kind of have to, but. Like we've never seen him win, and the tag division is so shallow. Like, there is nothing you could do to ever heat those guys up. That's just they're they're dead in the water. Doesn't mean they're not entertaining and they don't serve a purpose. But like, we're not going to see a tag team title run. I would be I would be shocked if if um that were to ever happen. I, w- I would be shocked if they won a match. To be honest, I don't know what their finishers are. I don't know what the finishers are. Half of the people on this show, Jabba Mora and all these guys. Like, I don't I don't even know how they would win a match if they were going to win a match. Um. After this was, and people were very surprised with my reaction to this. The Coven did something backstage, and it was not. I think they were. I don't know if they were outside or they were just in a in a dark room, but it was not. There wasn't goofy lighting. All all of these backstage segments and interviews, there was no goofy lighting or or anything like that. Everything just looked excellent, and um, the Coven is talking here, and everything the Coven has done up to this point has been horrible. They they are they have like killed single handedly double handedly if that's even a term have killed episodes. Now I'm gonna be careful with my coven talk. I I said this a couple times because I I met Kylan King and in real life she's beautiful. She's a good a great person, really fucking cool. Like after that interaction, I was like I can't I can't hammer the coven too hard at this point. But um, Taylor Wilde, you know. I had said, you know, I've been saying about this coven thing that maybe over time she's going to grasp what she wants the gimmick to be because it started off horrible. It started off with no explanation, number one. And then she, you know, <laughs> fake laughing and all this silliness and not really under- explaining the tarot cards and what they were what they were saying. You know, they're just randomly showing cards. She's she's looking at tarot cards in the middle of the match. Like it's always it's just been like horrible from the beginning. She started off as a baby face instead of them just committing them to her as a heel in the beginning. Like she was doing the gimmick as a baby face and then just kind of became a heel out of nowhere. Absolutely no direction to this. But they're sitting here and they're talking about the the age of Aquarius and some nonsense like that. Like if my um, fiance was not into that shit, it would sound like absolute nonsense to me. I, I, I get it a little bit because she she <laughs> enjoys all that kind of shit. I don't think she would enjoy this gimmick though. If I were to sit here and be like, "Hey, what do you think of this?" Like, I think she would think it's a little cheesy. But they're sitting here and they're talking, and they're talking about Diana Perazzo. And it sound. I mean, I thought it was good. I thought Taylor Wilde sounded good here. 
I didn't think she was like overly corny and cheesy. I, I you know, she is more, she has been more Papa Shango than Undertaker, you know, and, and I know I'm comparing Taylor Wilde to the Undertaker, but that is my point. It's been more goofy than like dark and serious. If they can get it, you know, like Julia Hart is actually a good example in uh, AEW. Um, if they can get it to to that level, uh, I think the Coven is not going to be so bad. And someone told me NXT's got a similar gimmick going on. I cannot watch that Women of Wrestling ass show. I shouldn't say Women of Wrestling Glow, uh, the Glow version of of wrestling, modern day Glow. Um, every once in a while, I, turn, I tune it on, but it's it's really fucking bad. Um, but I thought Taylor Wilde did good here. And then Kylan King spoke and she sounded really good too. And we haven't heard her speak on TV. I don't even know how much she spoke on TV period. Like I haven't heard her on AEW talk when she was doing stuff there. I know she was doing some NWA stuff for a while. Um, and they, you know, people tend to get some mic time with them, but, uh, this is the first time in this gimmick that we've heard her talk because before it seems like Taylor Wilde's the, the witch, and then Kylan King's just hanging out with her. Like that's just kind of how it came off. But, um, t- uh, you know, Ky- Kylan King's had really, really believable and said something about bitch or whatever at the end. Like I thought it was good. I honest to God did. And then, um, oh, negative BQ here, baby. Um, Sammy Callahan reveals that, um, he never had this. Was, this was one of the worst parts of the show, actually. Um, reveals that he never had intention to join in the design. Um, he's going to de- destroy them and every member of the group. Like, so this is going to continue. Um, this is a few no one cares about, um, but it's going to continue. Someone, I saw someone on a, man, I think it was Facebook was like, Hey, I watched impact for the first time in a while. Um, it's pretty good, but he's like, I mean, Callahan's fat as fuck, you know? So we see it. If we, see, I mean, we already see this stuff, but like him and Eddie Edwards, when we're watching the show, actually, he said, Sammy and Eddie. But imagine someone who hasn't watched the episode, this show in like a year and turning it on. You know, like these guys are not looking like stars right now. I hope that that, you know, that kind of improves. But um, we knew Sammy Callahan had had no intention of joining the design. It's not like uh, there was a swerve here. And I thought the little, um, what they did with him turning on him, I thought was not good at Rebellion. It was just... He said, like, when Sammy did an interview recently, he's like, we got something real cool. You know, this is going to be great. We got something cool coming. Like, I'm not seeing it. I'm not even a little bit seeing it. I'm seeing something that people think is good but is not. That's what I'm I'm getting out of this whole feud right now. I did like that he kind of ran down the steps. And he, Tom Hannafin, I didn't say this during the Rebellion review. He ran down all the steps and what they were. You know, that was really good. Tom Hannafin, is a, he really... um. He adds some stuff to these matches that is really overlooked. Like even in the opening BTI match, he was giving some background to Jack Price and Shogun. They weren't just like random dudes in the ring, you know. Like he was giving Shogun's got you know got this kind of training. He learned from his dad. Da, 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 da. You know what I mean? So he's good at adding those little details that that creatively otherwise are missing. Because with the 19 deadly steps, I was saying, you know, like, I don't know what these steps are. Like, they said what one and two was, and then he just kept saying, okay, now next week is step five. And then there's, like, no explanation of what it was. Um, So we'll see. The only way that this ends up good is if, like, Sammy brings back, like, um, Jake Christ or something like that, a Madman Fulton, and, and they become, like, that. that's where people will get very excited for that. That will make it interesting. And the teams are very similar in wrestlers. You know, um, Jake Christ and, and Angels and then Khan and, and Madman Fulton. Like, people would be into that. If that's where it's going, awesome. I, I think that's like fantasy booking personally. But um, it, it, it's, it, it is possible. It's possible to go in that direction. But right now, what, what I see is something that people involved think is good and is not. That's uh, And I think the majority of you would would agree with that. It wasn't that Sammy did a bad job here when I said it was one of the worst parts of the show. It just it was one of the worst parts because it was reminding us that this is going to continue. When we get um and oh another match when I said when I said all the jobbers of the company, like Sheldon Jean is on the show now. Now Sheldon Jean is a talented guy. We have not seen him win. We don't know what his finisher is. We know nothing about him. So that's just another guy when when they're putting out these match graphics graphics. 
Jabba Mora and Sheldon Jean and um, you know they didn't put the Alicia Edwards one out, but uh, um, the BTI guys, you know Jack Bryce and and Shogun and and the Good Hands. It's just it's just like all the all the people who don't win matches on, on are on this show. And Joe Hendry's obviously over. I didn't know that Sheldon Jean was a former Big Brother contestant and he was on pace to win before COVID. That's another thing. Like Tom Hannafin adds something to these matches that Matt Stryker or Josh Matthews was it. Now, to be clear, I I prefer Josh Matthews' voice to Tom Hannafin, but I didn't like the comedy and the silliness and just you know, and then Stryker him fo- just phoning it in and being phony and um, Tom Hannafin overall does the best job, but he adds something to the show. He really, he really truly does. I think him and, and uh, I don't like like, but the the overall commentary, him and Ray wall, like, I don't like their voices. I don't really like listening to them, but I like what they have to say. They really do add stuff. And just to give this little, you know, big, like if they didn't say that and then Joe Hendry came down and said, Oh, I heard you on big brother. Like we would have been like, what the fuck are you talking about? So um, good on that. They feel that Joe Hendry needs to come out and talk before every match. And even though he does some like really interesting and entertaining backstage stuff, I don't think when he comes out to the ring and grabs the microphone that it's particularly good. I don't think it's necessary. You know, I think it'll make what he does backstage stand out more if he doesn't talk every show. But they've been doing this for the most part when he wrestles. I think the first couple were okay, but like for the most part, I don't find them that good. But um, Joe Hendry wins a match with the standing ovation. I don't know how Sheldon Jean got a title match here. Uh, This was very like TNA, you know, Marche Rocket showing up and getting an X Division title shot against. DJZ the next night type of shit. Um, but yeah, Joe Hendry wins. He's over. The song's great. Joe Hendry, Joe Hendry is great. It's just, I, I don't think he needs to talk between the matches, before the matches. And we don't really know what's next for him. Like Brian Myers and Moose look like they're moving on. Um, beat a couple job guys. So I, I don't know what they got next for Joe Hendry. And then they run down next week's card. This is where they got to get We Own the Night on there. And we're getting Jordan Grace versus Masha Slamovich. Now, I don't read spoilers. I have no clue who wins this match. If Masha does not win this match, like stick a fucking fork in her. At least it's not for the knockouts title this time. So hopefully she wins. And we're expecting Jordan Grace to be gone here after this set of tapings. So put Masha over on the way out. Like, like they have good matches, but Masha has lost so much after winning so much that she needs to win. And I think this was initially supposed to be Masha versus Killer Kelly. I don't remember what happened. I think Killer Kelly got, she had a cyst rupture or some shit like that. Um, so I would rather see Kill, uh, Kelly and, and, and them cheeks um, on the show. But um, we're getting Jordan versus Masha. So it should be, it should be really, really good. Then we're getting a- ABC versus the design. Can you have a less cool name after having one of the cooler names in wrestling? You can say what you want about the Bullet Club. It's a great name. ABC is not. It just you lose all, all benefit of being part of the Bullet Club by having this just random ass. I should say random common ass name. I, I don't like it at all. Maybe you guys do. Maybe you don't even care. You know. Maybe I care too much. They're wrestling the design. None of these teams can take a loss. I mean, the design is not a team that wins a lot, but if they have this feud going with Sammy, I'm not expecting a clean finish here. Um, then Deanna defends a knockouts world title against Taylor Wilde. So Taylor Wilde just, or in a first time ever matchup, Taylor Wilde just does this backstage talk, segment talking, and then all of a sudden she gets a knockouts world title shot. So, you know, I say this a lot with the knockouts, especially the knockouts tag team titles. Like you... There's not enough. There, there is a decent amount of knockouts on the roster, but there's not enough to, to defend the titles as much as they do. You know, this you could have just made this a non-title match. The graphic for this match was really funny because deanna has got the belt, but it's covered by her her name, so you can't see the belt. It looks like she's just standing there with her arms crossed, and it does not show that she is the knockouts world champion. So 
very poor job on that. But it's got Taylor Wilde with her belt. So just kind of a poor job. When they put these graphics out that have the gray background, I think they 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 look really good. It's it's the the red ones that are just I mean, obviously there's overkill of red on the show, but the gray ones I think are just different. And I've said this many a many a time that these gray graphics should be on display in the background instead of the impact screensaver during the match. I think as they're wrestling, we should see that graphic in the background. It would look very cool. We get Steve Macklin's changing of the guard. You know, as a military guy, when they have military wrestlers on screen, I tend to really eye roll at them and find them very cringe because they're so far from like, you know, Lacey Evans being the best example, obviously. Um, the veterans of war when we had them on TNA for a while. They are so far from how we do actually act in real life. Um, or even at work and the job or even deployed downrange. Like it's very far from, um, they're very like, uh, you, they turn up the volume too much on that. Macklin is not that he is how you, you portray a veteran. You take the, the, the core values that we learned, the mindset we've learned, um, and you put that in a character in their presentation, but you don't overly deliver it. Um, and trust me, when I'm out in public, I get it a lot. Someone, I just got it yesterday. Um, the guy I hired to mow my lawn comes up and I get it all the time. You in the military? And I'm like, yeah, how'd you know? They say, well, it's either how you walk, how you stand, how you act, how you talk. There's always something, but I get it quite a bit because, because of just how I carry myself. Um, so Macklin is like that. That's that's how I so I connect with him because that's how they present him on TV. He's not overly like a tent hut and shit like that because that's not how we are at all. Um, but when the guys came out with the the camouflage shirts and all that, that was a little hokey. Um, that's not usually how he does his character, but he does the changing the guard. You know, that's a military term, or he could have been change of command. And I thought overall it was pretty decent. I thought he looked good with like a security detail. I wouldn't be, I wouldn't turn that. I, I wouldn't be against that being part of his gimmick every week. He comes to the ring and he got, oh, excuse me, comes to the ring, has a security detail. I think that would, um, you know, these guys might get their ass kicked every single time, but I think it would add a little bit of a different presentation. I can't think of many wrestlers who would come out with like a bodyguards. You, you might have like the one bodyguard, the tall, you know, arms crossed Savannah Evans, but I'm saying with like a little security detail like that. Um, I think that would actually be kind of cool. So I hope, I hope they continue to do that. I, I really highly doubt it though. I don't think that's what they're going to do. So my big takeaway from this was that I felt he, they, that they took the shackles off him and he really delivered well. Crowd was a little out of it, but they were kind of out of it for the episode. But I thought he had good interactions with the crowds. I'll, I'll hit a kid. Like they show him yelling at someone and then they pan and it's a child. I thought that was funny. Um, but just just overall, I, I it just felt like they they let the they 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 just took the shackles off and said, go out there and be you. And I thought he stepped it up significantly from the way he normally talks. So I was really happy about this. I'm happy that Nick Aldis didn't come out and ruin it. But the person who did come out ruin it was Scott Demore. And he, so Macklin calls out uh, open challenge to a uh, Canadian wrestler. And then Scott Demore comes out immediately. Um, and I, I think I'll always have respect for what he does as president of Impact Wrestling. I just don't like his on screen character i just never have i thought they were writing him off tv and having santino it, like gail kim would be so much better suited with this i mean the, the headset and the annoying voice Arr, let me tell you Arr. i mean just is there a more annoying voice in this company than than, than scott when he's on uh on screen again i re i respect everything he does for the company 
That is not me. Like, oh, I hate Scott Demore. I don't hate him. I just don't like his on-screen character. That's it. A lot of people don't. But at least they're like pulling back on it because he used to be like the star of the show. And now at least he's just involving himself when it matters. And this is obviously part of the storyline. You know, eventually his guy Josh is going to come back or whatever, you know. So I get it. I totally get it. I'm just saying I'm annoyed by him. But he comes out and, um, you know, he's, he's saying I shouldn't have handed a title to you like that. But of course, you hit me from behind. I was hoping he was going to lay Scott Demore out again. Um, I popped big time for that. It was like a baby face turn in my household when um, he hit Scott Demore with the belt. I was hoping he was going to take him out again. Um, but he didn't. And then he says, so this is again, this is the logic that I'm talking about. So Scott Demore calls out a Canadian wrestler. Scott Demore shows up 10 seconds later. And after he's doing all this talking for a real long time, he says, your opponent at under siege is going to be a Canadian, the perfect creation, whatever the hell he said, PCO. And then PCO comes out. At what point did Scott Newmore talk to PCO and how, and uh, about him being the challenger at under siege? It was an impromptu open challenge to someone who's Canadian. And, you know, and Scott's like, are you just ducking Nick Aldis? So, you know, Nick Aldis is going to, no matter who Steve Macklin is fighting, Nick Aldis is going to be involved in this one way, shape, or form, which I don't like that because that just tells us Steve Macklin is going to win all these matches, which I want him to, but we just know, you know, you can have him wrestle Jesus Christ. And he, we know that Macklin is going to win now because they're building towards him and Aldis. I just wish they would not do that. But again, Scott Demore comes out seconds later. And then just says, your opponent is PCO. And here comes PCO. Like, PCO hangs out in the fucking basement. At, at, it's like, okay, was he hanging out in Gorilla? And you were talking to him on the way out? Like, hey, if he, you know, thank God you're here, PCO. Like, he didn't call him on the phone. So was, was he hanging out in Gorilla? And he said, hey, I- I'm going to go out there. Um, thank God you're standing here. He just so happened to be acting for asking for a Canadian challenger. You're one of the only ones we have. Thank goodness. Thanks God you're here and not in the basement. Um, just hang out here uh, and I'm going to call you out seconds later. So that's the kind of shit that um, just just illogical, you know, um, but whatever. I guess it's not really that big of a deal. But um, and they had a little little whatever uh, with the with the security detail. And, you know, I was happy because he went off the air with the belt and, and you know, he didn't get his ass kicked by PCO. Like, that's what I was concerned about after this I, I may watch it once on twitter here and give you my thoughts but tom hannafin and mac um ray wall did a, a post show like i've said this many times like no one cares about kfa post shows no one gives a fucking shit they did aftershock which was a great name horrible show everyone was mad at me back then was like give it tell me to give it a chance like there's never been consistency in a post show they've done it several times it lasts like three or four episodes. Nobody watches. Nobody cares because it's a, a kayfabe review show. Nobody. We know what we just watched. We don't have to hear someone in character talk about what we just watched. No fucking buddy cares. But I think they're streaming it on Twitter as well as YouTube. So they're going to say, oh, well, they got all these impressions and this and this. Like, I'm curious to see what the... um the views are. I'm actually going to click on this link right now and try to get an idea of what the views are. Ooh, sorry, guys. I'm playing in the background. Ooh, hopefully that's not hurting your ears. That was really loud. I apologize. I am so, so sorry. Um, looking at the views, it's not really showing. Yeah, it's not It's not showing what the, the views are on this thing. There's 468 likes which probably tells me it, it tells me it's maybe like 10,000 views on this thing. Oh, it's got 11. Okay. Now I see 11,000 views. Okay. I, sh- I showed you my, my YouTube savvy there a little bit. I usually can have an idea just based off the likes, how many views something's got. So 11,000 for a day. Okay. Whatever. Let's look at the comments here though. 
I like the idea of a post show recap with commentators explaining matches, reasons for matches, explaining feuds instead of just showing highlights. Okay. Um, someone say here is loving this post show idea. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe I'm wrong. Maybe loving this post show idea off us awful stuff. I mean, I'm sorry, awesome stuff. And then another awesome stuff. Love these small little changes. In fact, it's done. Um, love this post show. You need to show. Someone says you need to show exclusive interviews to have some exclusive content. There we go. Maybe have Santino on the show and let him announce a match here and there. Don't do that. But but yeah, you should need to have some um, exclusive content. Uh, what else? What else we got here? Love the recap. Okay, so people are liking this. Maybe I'm um, maybe I'm wrong on this. Um, nice to see you. Uh, India. Everyone's happy that Indie Hall of Famer Jimmy Jacobs is back in Impact. I don't think he ever left. Um, no, okay. Everyone seems to like this in the comments, and there's there's quite a few comments here. So uh, someone says it's better than BTI. So we'll see. Um, I think I'll I think I'll, I'll I'll check it out here and get my my um, reaction again. I'm sorry I hit play. Uh, hit the link there and it was, it was probably a lot louder than my speech is right now. So if it did, um, sorry about that, but interesting, interesting. Um, Oh, let me l- read this one comment and then I'll sign off. I don't like where this, I don't like this thing where a surprise person from BFE comes in for championship matches. And he says BFE like bump fuck Egypt. So just out of nowhere, absolutely nothing as build up. Nick Aldis comes back and Mickey goes home to hang with their child and gives up their championship out of nowhere. Yeah, okay, this is why WWE will always outlive their competition. Storylines, people, storylines. So what he's saying is like people just want to see story sometimes. Like, like I talk about it quite a bit, like the random championship matches that just just come out of the blue. You know, that's kind of, kind of what they're saying here. So I don't know. Maybe, maybe this concept is going to work. I will check it out. Um, I wouldn't. I wouldn't be surprised if you know, a week later, it's gone. Not a week. I'm sorry. Like a, a couple months later, it's completely gone. I, I wouldn't be, I wouldn't be shocked. So that's going to do it for me, guys. I'm your boy BQ and um, we'll be recording some Patreon content here pretty soon. And I will talk to you soon. Peace.